you mentioned that there wasn't any real well-being scale, although there are many models as you've described. Um, is there a reason for this discrepancy? Because I feel generally if you make models for certain things and there is, and as you've described, there has been a lot of work done. Why hasn't this kind of translated into any measurable skills to kind of help with this in you know the public domain? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, there is work by Dr. Stephanie Palmer, the trailblazer, um, who over 20 years ago actually started the development of the first Māori wellbeing scale with her PhD. Um, and so it's built off that work of, of hers for that kind of individual level psychometric one. She also wrote a really amazing um, paper called Māori Psychometrics, which kind of explores the now kind of like reactionary notion that anything that's quantitative can't be Māori or can't be Indigenous or is just colonizer. When in reality, she talked about our ancestors navigating the Pacific, not with just oral traditions and whatever, just words, but like through actually really great complex measurement um, and understandings like that. And in that paper, she has a fantastic chat about how there is all that alignment and how so many of those, you know, so, sort of understandings and approaches already existed within our culture um, before European arrival. And then so I actually got the the privilege to, to meet her by chance really randomly, which was really funny. Um, just as I was delivering a presentation to her about her own work. <laughs> so I had a the front of her paper on one of my slideshows and I found out that it was her and I was like, oh my God, it's so cool. It's so good to meet. And she was talking about how she started the initial development, but it was just an issue of funding. Um, and for her that she had these really great ideas like over 20 years ago um, to do this, but struggled with with getting the resourcing to get it off the ground and to further develop her measure. Um, and hers initially emerged from the kind of maternal well-being um, after birth and how to look after Māori mums. So it wasn't as general, I don't think. Um, and it was a, a bit more tailored to those experiences. But over the time as well, we've seen different sorts of measures come out. Um, and those have come out at different levels. So the Rangatira, the chief I mentioned before, Sir Mason Jury, he wrote a really amazing paper 20 years ago about measuring well-being and measuring Māori well-being. And he talks about the importance of looking at it at different levels. So the individual, the whānau, the family, the community, and the population level, and that we need different measures and tools and understandings at different levels and to bring them all together to properly understand. Um, and so we have seen the development of some more around that community and population level. There's been the development of Te Kupinga, which is the national stats survey um, done for Māori. And so there have been like a range of little developments, but on that individual um, level that is like psychometrically tested, there hadn't been that. And I just think, yeah, you have to have and to be in that stats area and to have the time and yeah the opportunity i guess to to do it and to work in the space pretty niche um sort of area and there's heaps of other really amazing cool areas that people go off and research and work in which i think understandably takes them away from like what can be boring numbers and uh stuff like that at times so i think that contributes to why there hasn't been stuff like this already um, there has been other really cool quantitative work that's been happening in the Māori identity space. Um, so, yeah, it's been like it, almost like a decade, maybe a decade since the development of a previous Māori identity and I think maybe well-being as well um, measure. But, yeah, where we are definitely seeing a... Uh, a big wave of Māori quantitative research and tools within the social sciences emerge, which is which is really cool. 
Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's definitely a time for it and it's having a time now. I also just wanted to point out that when we say 20 years ago, it's still the 2000s. It's like 2004, 2003. So this is very new stuff in that regard. It's when we say ages ago, 20 years ago, it's not, uh, what do you say? It, it's not like the 60s or 70s. This is after Finding Nemo was released 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Love that as a time, a time stamp. <laughs> yeah. I was also wondering uh, when you were talking about uh, Maori culture is also having a strong uh, sense of measurement and stuff like that. I find it so funny that, you know, the, the stereotype of the indigenous person tends to be, you know, like they get all their answers from the moon spirit or something like that. But like, no, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. You know, these are also human beings who had to navigate the seas and build things and invent things. And obviously there's uh, math involved and some physics involved that probably pays it to this. So I'm, I, I have a question which might be a slight digression, but I'm thinking, especially when you think about some of these like decolonial conversations and there's an assumption that science as it exists right now is a Western conception and some there are some aspects of it that are i guess uh whatever post enlightenment cartesian binary stuff that exists but i'm i'm, I'm kind of wondering what your thoughts are having done this whole process and having dabbled in the qualitative and the quantitative when we keep talking about western science how much of it really is western well i think that's a really great uh, point to hit on, bro, and I think that's one that's kind of not really well understood by a lot of people, and they'll say, oh, it's Western this, Western that, kind of forgetting, you know, where our numerals come from and where our systems of counting, you know, they don't come from, like, ancient England, they come from the Middle East, um, <laughs> and they come from all these other diverse sources, um, and I think, yeah, what I always like to say is that the Western science is not about, like, kind of where it came from, but it's kind of saying which worldviews and systems are dominating. It's dissemination, production, um, and prioritizing and stuff. And so there, if you have some time after, there's been some real spicy, racist conversations that have happened in New Zealand around the inclusion of Maori knowledge within the curriculum, around what counts as science, what doesn't, um, which has got to do with a lot of old white men being a bit protective of what they think is science, what can count, whose methods are, you know, valued and valuable. Um, but what I think is really cool and what I like is this idea of working at the interface of different knowledge systems and ways of being and working. So this is what our Māori scholars have talked about for a while now, pre-Finding Nemo, um, about working at that kind of interface, about just going and using different tools for the betterment of our peoples um, and the importance of when you're doing that, having them both prioritized and valued to the same amount so you're not just doing like psychometrics with a sprinkle of like culture on it with a few Māori words. But yeah, it's like deeply engaging with it and looking at those different like fundamental assumptions and priorities um, and kind of navigating that. And so, yeah, there's heaps of really great work, people from our university, people like Ocean Mercia, um, who have written amazing stuff uh, about working at that interface. And yeah, it is complex. Our knowledge systems are complex and are super intricate, intricate and well-designed and just for everyone else to, to kind of know, before we started recording, we were talking about um, the amazing depth of knowledge of indigenous peoples that say still live out in like the jungles and stuff and their understandings of different mushrooms and whatever. Um, from a Maori perspective, we have a, a system of organizing these different things in the environment and different interactions. And we... Uh, it all comes under this concept called whakapapa, and whakapapa meaning to to layer on each other. It's also the word for genealogy. So when I talked about it at the start of my, my introduction, I, I link 
genealogy link. I link um, my ancestral links are to this different place. And then so within that whakapapa framework, that genealogy in Aotearoa, our ancestors organized the entire known world within one giant cosmological family tree. And so it's saying that we have all these different species of mushrooms or sweet potatoes, and they all came from this one person through this story. Um, but through those stories, they contain, you know, which one's good, which one's bad, which is good for what. Um, it'll contain some stories about there around the morals and explaining interactions between certain things. And so that's what I think is really cool is when we can yeah take that critical look at our own stories and we can look at it as all of this codified wisdom and knowledge that is just there for us to learn from and to take and to apply to our current day endeavors and research and projects and yeah yeah there's some cool stuff there search up fucker papa <laughs> No, that's that's awesome. That's really, really awesome. And thank you for that answer. I kind of want to pick it two strands uh, of what we were discussing. You you talked a little bit about now this this layering of knowledge, uh, the fucker papa, and the idea of like uh, working with uh, this codified knowledge. And I'm also thinking earlier when you talk about how one of the metrics you have in your scale is a relationship to the land. I'm wondering, what does that look like in this context? Where does it sit in the Papa? How does it vary amongst the different Maori people? What exactly does it look like in terms of people's relationship to the to the non-human, more than human world? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, if we go back to our creation stories, we look at the uh, the separation of Rangi Nui, the Sky Father, and Papa Tuanuku, the Earth Mother. And in them, some of our uh, primordial ancestors coming apart, emerging from within them, and them being different aspects of the environment. So you have, for say, Tafuri Matia, who is the Atua, the deity of the wind, um, Tangaroa, the deity of the ocean, um, a whole bunch of them. And then so from that whakapapa approach, we can trace through and look at the different generations that have come. And actually, in some people and in some traditions, can link their genealogy from now up to them. Um, so you have that thing of this is the line of descent in which we actually come from these people. So there is a, a very spiritual connection that comes from that and knowing and understanding that. Um, there is the when we talk about where we fuck a papa to when we introduce ourselves we often start off with which ocean which river which mountain do you affiliate with which is those different areas that sustained the well-being of your ancestors and even your family today so even the everyday interactions of saying and introducing yourself that connection to the land and those different parts of land and land features are really important. Um, and then, like I mentioned at the start, or maybe even before we started recording, about the urbanization of Māori and the huge and rapid cultural disconnection that happened um, when Māori moved from rural aspects of where they, or rural places where they traditionally stayed um, into the cities for work, came that big severance of that connection between the land, between those places that they came from. And then so there are, you know, of course, huge populations of urban Māori that are disconnected. Um, and so that's another interesting kind of dynamic to have in there about relationships with the land. Because for some people, they'll be like, oh, yeah, this is my land. I've been there. I know at like the back of my hand. Then there's others that have been like, oh, I don't actually know where my family's land is from. I don't know which tribe I'm from. Um, and so, yeah, that that issue of, of land can be difficult for different people. And that speaks to what we talk about as there being yeah, diverse Māori realities for all these different 
um, reasons. And then another cool thing is that, as I mentioned, there are those those different Atua, those deities, um, which some people talk about them yet yeah, being personifications of different domains of the environment. So from some Maori spiritual perspectives, connecting spiritually involves going to those different domains. Um, and so for a lot of Maori, spiritual connection and sustenance comes from the environment. It comes from being um, in the bush and all those different places. So that's why it got its whole own thing. Um, because, yeah, people talked about how much well-being they, they get from engaging in those you know, activities and those different domains and areas. Um, so, yeah, a real special, close relationship with the land and with the natural environment and that here for a lot of Māori in Aotearoa.